Welcome to Speaking of Strong Style, where we discuss the events, news, and issues surrounding New Japan Pro Wrestling. I'm Stephen Conway, and with me, as always, is Jeremy Feinstone. We are both contributors to the Fight Game Media Network. Jeremy, it is G1 time. We're about one-third of the way through the big tournament, and so far, I have to say, it's exceeding expectations. Yeah, man, 30 minutes or less on that delivery. I'm totally satisfied so far. You know, <laughs> I am just, I'm real happy with what I'm seeing, and I feel like, uh, New Japan is firing in all cylinders right now. How about you? I'm enjoying it a lot. And I know that this format with the four blocks is not as conducive to the consistent great matches we've seen in the past. But I think the guys are doing what they can do with it. And we have seen a lot of great matches in these uh, shows. And we're going to come across a couple of them here today. We're going to be talking about the last four. Uh, all took place in Metropolitan Tokyo. We had the Oda Ward Gymnasium and Corican Hall to each. And uh, there were some fantastic uh, contests in these. So maybe we're not seeing uh, the, the proliferation of them because you would have 10 guys in a block and nine matches and all the best guys always fought each other. But uh, what we are seeing is when guys do have a chance to step up, they're doing so. And so far, I think that these have been very, very good shows. I'm excited about uh, getting into it. We do have one bit of uh, news that just came up the other day before we start talking about G1, and that is the announcement that there is going to be an IWGP women's title coming soon. And this is going to be in association with Stardom. Of course, we've talked before. New Japan and Stardom are going to be holding a dual-branded show for the very first time. Both of those companies are owned by the Bushi Road conglomerate in Japan. And they've been talking about doing more integration. And what we're going to see is more of these mixed shows where you're going to have some women on the men's show, some men on the women's show, perhaps. The other thing they mentioned, Jeremy, was yeah. that as part of their North American tours and NJPW Strong, they were going to in start incorporating women's wrestling into those because they know that the North American uh, culture is having mixed shows. Of course, in Japan... Mm -hmm women mostly have their own promotions. There are a bunch of very good ones that are uh, completely made up of uh, female performers. And then of course there's the, the men's companies and we're, we're here to talk about new Japan, but most of our viewers know this in North America. Of course, the culture is you have a mixed show. So there can, they're con creating an IWGP women's title so that those women have something to fight over. And we don't know anything about how it's going to be determined. We don't know who's, if there's going to be a tournament, a battle royal. we don't know any of that. But at first instinct, Jeremy, do you think this is a good idea? I mean, it, on one hand, it's yet another belt and it seems like we're getting a new one every five minutes, but for this one, there might be a good purpose to it. Yeah. You know, I think having the world and wonder of stardom belts, the red and white belts being uh, defended and maintained and their stature over in uh, Japan is incredibly important. But at the same time, there needs to be a marker or some type of uh, just some type of belt out there that is treated to a high level that is representative of when this talent that people are unfamiliar with coming from Japan, they're like, oh, this person's a champion. This is someone I should pay attention to. It's an immediately a credibility lifter. So I'm looking at it as something above the New Japan US title rather than um, the New Japan Strong title. And I think that's probably the correct level of um, uh, the tier that it should be in. Uh, kind of like the United States title is below the IWGP heavyweight title. But the people who carry it are people that you would consider world title contenders, if that, if, if you would. Not maybe not the world title champion at the time, but somebody that you could see pivot back and forth if need be, kind of a Kenny Omega level uh, holder. Yeah, it's something that is also identified directly with IWGP. They're naming it that. And so that's something that the fans in North America are familiar with. And if they did just send a few women over to be on these shows, because like you said, in North America, you expect mixed shows, but if, if they're just there to do that, then the matches don't really have any real meaning. This is a championship that those women can then fight over. You can mm -hmm. do angles, you can do feuds, you can do challengers being built for a champion. And it gives it a storyline thing instead of, hey, we're also going to have two or three women's matches on this. So it, it gives it, 
uh, it's a, the, the classic thing in showbiz, the MacGuffin. There's, you got to mm-hmm. have something for the people to fight over. And, and that's what drives the plot. And this will be something here uh, I think will add to uh, their presence uh, and not, not just terrific matches, but terrific matches that mean something in the grand scheme of things. I use this word because a lot of people use this word, but it expands the universe of stardom. Um, It gives an opening for uh, women talent in the States who a would like to break into some level of stardom adjacent working style. It gives them an opportunity to do that. And it also breaks through what stardom is in the world. There are, there are great people on our own site, Scott Edwards talked about the five-star Joshi that like he's running circles around some of us with the knowledge that he has. And this stuff just sounds incredibly, incredibly fascinating. And I don't, and I don't mean to undercut it or make it sound, Oh gee, women, they're doing so great. You know, it's nothing like yeah. that. It's just, there's so much wrestling in this world that you have to pick and choose what you're able to cover and what you're able to like maintain a, an amount of interest that both like respectful of your time and respectful of the time of the people you're watching. So it, it's nothing, nothing demeaning or, you know, oh, shucks, good job. It really is just like a time issue. And if they're able to, Put start a matches on shows that I'm already watching. I am here for it. Yeah, it's another encouraging sign they're taking this seriously, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, all right. So with that in mind, again, we don't know a whole lot about this. We're going to spend a ton of time on that title because it was just announced. We don't know the format of how they're going to determine the I, champion. I do believe that the uh, the November 20th show is going to be a very big, I believe they're crowning at that show. They're crowning the champion right. of that show, which... If we haven't underlined it enough and put an exclamation and circled it around, that November 20th start of New Japan show is going to be an incredibly big deal. Yeah. So much so that I would not be shocked if the main event of Wrestle Kingdom was determined at that show. Mm. Well, you know, you mentioned that. And we're going to get into a little bit yeah. of that because they are – stars are aligning, folks. If you haven't been listening the last couple of weeks, I would recommend you go back and listen to some of the things that Jeremy mentioned regarding that November 20th show because – Things are starting to line up the way he talked about as far as what could be going on with a couple of the people in this tournament and how uh, they can get into the main event of Wrestle Kingdom, which seems to be a plot point for a couple of different guys in this thing and and more guys than just Mm -hmm. one singles match. So uh, something needs to happen. And and I I think you might be on to something important there. So, well, let's get out a thread and I started pulling. You did. You did. (laughs) You did. We'll see how it turns out. But let's let's get into this G1 because. Uh, it started off the the week. Now we we were on last Thursday, and then uh, started off in the weekend at the Oda War Gymnasium in Metropolitan Tokyo. This is, of course, a classic venue for New Japan Pro Wrestling, going all the way back. And uh, they had uh, one thousand nine hundred nineteen is the listed attendance for uh, day four. A few more uh, better attended on day five, but. Uh, the fo- folks there on day four saw the preview tags, and we won't go into those too much for for both time reasons. And to be honest, there wasn't a ton of uh, plot points here in that one. Uh, the the third match, especially the Bullet Club versus Suzuki Goon, that match was worked like everybody was double parked, mm-hmm. like they were going to get a ticket if they hung around that arena too long. Uh, man, they you know they they got out of there quickly. The one thing I like about some of these quick preview tags is it's keeping these shows to around three hours brisk very brisk shows uh, they're they're nice and tight i i like that we're yes. we're we're moving right along and so the first block match in that one uh was a good technical wrestling match with a lot of submission work and a lot of hard kicks and strikes it uh, had an mma type feel to it zach saber jr got the win over aaron hanare and uh, Hanare has really, really improved, and Zaber's always been good. Uh, I enjoyed this one. Again, it had like that MMA feel where a lot of working towards submissions, and Hanare with those kicks that he seems mm-hmm. to have developed that are uh, strong, stiff, and look pretty safe. He's getting them in the right spot. I enjoyed it. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot to like about this match. I think we also got a very good uh, indicator of how they're going to pace storytelling for per the individual performers we got uh first second match for aaron hanare and now the narrative has been his achilles is messed up and he has the out for any match that he loses or he has the in for any match that he overcomes overwhelming odds uh they've created a little bit of a story for him and they're starting to do that with all the uh with all the the players in the tournament. Yeah. So I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that everybody's got a story to tell, whether it's an A story, a B story, or a C story. Uh, 
every one of these matches has a consequence that feels like uh, it plays into the bigger picture. And for me, that makes for a more holy, uh, holy positive experience in watching. Just a, a rewarding experience, if you will. And so we had uh, Zack Sabre Jr. going 2-0 and an RA 1-1 one and one on that one. And then we had Shingo Takagi and Yoshihashi. Now, this is one that I thought, when going into it, it's going to be a good match. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Both those yeah. guys are very capable workers. But I didn't know it was going to have a whole lot of drama because who really believes that Shingo Takagi is going to lose to Yoshihashi? And these two managed to convince me for a little while, Jeremy, that, oh, my God, they're going to beat Shingo with this guy. Maybe it's Shingo that's going to have the trouble getting it. And anyway... This was terrific. I mean, these guys really showed up here. A great last five minutes. Yoshihashi has some charisma issues. It just it, His facial expressions aren't quite there, but he does not have working issues. This dude can work. And Shingo's incredible. So once it came down to it, when uh, Yoshihashi actually hit that brain buster of yes. the, the Kuma Kuroshi, I guess is what it's called, for a near fall, there was a moment. I have it in my notes. I'm reading my notes right here. It just says... You know, like the Shingo's incredible. Yoshi's turning it up. I'm convinced is what I wrote. You know, like, the I the I air right there is like, oh, he might win this thing. The air was sucked out of the room on a couple of those near falls. Yeah. Like you're just like you're holding your breath. They're like, okay, no, okay, all right. Yeah, like a... you, you definitely did believe at some point that like Yoshihashi could is going to gut this out and pull the upset. And that's the magic of the G1 is that it can it's so self contained. That mm -hmm. anybody can beat anybody else, but they're teasing these upset wins. They haven't, they haven't pulled the trigger other than the Hiroshi Tanahashi Aaron Tanari match of the upset, and they're right. going to pick their shots when they do it. But yeah. because you've introduced the possibility of it, the power of the possibility makes the match that much better. It's not that it happens or it doesn't; it's that you believe that it could. Mm -hmm. And that's all that you need to be invested in these matches because of its self-contained nature. If you if you have an idea of what the end game is, and you know that there's 20 different ways to get there, the fun of figuring out which way they're going to take. And Shingo Takagi looked dead, but he escaped with a roll up. It was uh, and he managed to get desperation out of desperation play, <laughs> desperation play. He got his win, so that uh, that gives him uh, some gets him on the board right there. And uh, Yoshihashi, terrific performance. I mean, I, I, I'm. He's had a decent year, you know, in the last uh, 12 months. The last yeah. uh, holding the and, title, yeah, some belts. He's uh, hell, he's had some big wins and key moments. I, I think Gato's starting to believe in him a little bit more. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out and how the there's rest of that, his tournament goes. There's that, but there's also, I think, there's a renewed credibility on the never open weight trio titles, yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think trios are uh, going to be a thing going into 20, tw the end of 2022, 2023. Sure and so right. uh, putting the the, the low-key background effort into establishing more credibility for, for these guys is, is an important is an important plan, you know, not not priority, but you know, you could build these other things as you're doing the big picture stuff. And then we had an interesting match here, uh, Jeremy. The next one, it was a semi-main event at uh, Oda Ward, and this was Kazuchika Okada against Toru Yano. We mentioned at the end of the last show, they worked hard to establish that Okada and Yano were a little mad at each other in their preview tag. They got a little chippy there at the end, mm -hmm. a little bit more than you would usually see from the two of them. Well, Toru Yano went full-on GHB again. He came out, his hair wasn't dyed, he had his old uh, group's T-shirt on, and he was the violent, sake-swilling Yano before he became the clown prince of New Japan Pro Wrestling. And to me, it almost was a sign of respect for Okada that in storyline that, yes. okay, I'm not going to clown with you. Yes. This isn't like this is more important than that. And I recognize that it's more important than that. And I'm going to go down fighting. It's It's not going to be. Uh, the usual Yano match, and it was not at all. It was yeah. it was rougher and tougher, and uh, you know, was it uh, one of those match of the year candidates? Of course not. It's still it's still Yano, and uh, but as a brawler, it showed that he still kind of got that when he wants to pull it out once yeah. in a while. I thought this was good. It was it was something different, and they and it was certainly better than if they did a, a, a silly match with Okada and Yano. I will I will say 
I don't know if this is recency bias, but I do think that if I'm going to think of the best Yano Okada match that I've ever seen, I think this ranks up there as the match that is, is going to be near the top, if not the top. But it felt like you couldn't do that match with any two other people. It was a match completely unique to those two because of the dynamic, the relationship, their roles within the company. And I'm glad that when we got that uh, once in a while lifetime, once in a while matchup, sorry, not lifetime, uh, (laughs) once in a while matchup, that it felt special in a way that you're like, okay, they're still, you know, relatively on the same side. But you know, Yano came to fight. Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah, and, and you know, it was it was nice. Uh, he almost pulled it off, but uh, he, Okada did end up uh, beating him there. But uh, the just the way it was worked, I enjoyed that. I I, I liked that they made up afterwards. Yeah. There wasn't some big angle with that, but uh, seeing uh, seeing them do it a different way was was satisfying there. So a breath of I, fresh air. Yeah, really was. So and he can go back to clowning against everybody else. And the the funny thing is the way they book Yano. Where, you know, he sneaks around and he'll, uh, you know, distract the referee, hit the guy underneath and uh, on the undercarriage there and roll him up and pin him. It always leaves the door open that he might win. There's never a point where you're sure that Yano's going to lose. And there were even a couple of times in this one, and I did not think that Okada was going to lose to Yano. But, it, you know, they make you think a little bit in there because sure. the, just the way he does it, and it's similar to House of Torture where uh, because of all the bull crap that they do and all the interference and all the ref bumps, there's always that chance that they might beat somebody that, that in New Japan they normally wouldn't. And uh, Yano has that kind of air of danger about him, especially in a tournament. You made me. You made me realize that Yano is essentially a Looney Tunes cartoon come to life. Uh, he's episodic. He's episodic slapstick in which mm-hmm. three weeks ago he was involved in a dog cage match, and we've completely forgotten. <laughs> and now, and now we're in the middle. Right after, right after, right before, he's doing chair running in and out with Foley in a match and mm. na- and then you've got in the middle of this uh a, a go hard against Okada match and they're all completely disparate they're all mm. like different episodes of Wiley Coyote or Daffy Duck uh mm-hmm. going after and you know things blowing up in their face but you come back and it's right back to the same you know check the boxes this is Yano we're gonna do our thing mm. and uh he held he holds up well and that that's a testament to being uh, that kind of character in New Japan, and he does it well. On to the main event there, and this was terrific. These two worked so well together. Jay White and Tomohiro Ishii, 22 minutes uh, and two seconds, and Jay White got the victory, but as always, uh, these two really work well together, and Jay has his kind of snot-nosed little heel mannerisms, and we mentioned it before. I love the way he works. He doesn't try to be cool. He doesn't try to be the popular heel uh, he is very comfortable being hated. Ishii is exactly the right kind of guy for someone like that because he's just so straight ahead. He is relentless. He's the Terminator in that you think he's dead and the bifurcated half of his body continues to crawl toward you over and over again. And, and it's always like you barely squeak by Ishii every time. And Jay is brilliant at just squeaking by someone. It's one of his best attributes as a heel. He did it here, and uh, it was a terrific match between two, two terrific wrestlers. You know, a lot of people say that MJF is the best up-and-coming future, best heel, best whatever in the world, but it's Jay White. Jay mm-hmm. White is is a better wrestler when he has a chance to do the promo because he doesn't do pro, he doesn't get the mic at nearly as much as MJF. Right, he's better. And mm-hmm. there are matches like this that uh, he had a match with Ishii in November that he dropped the uh, never open weight title for. And it was the only match he lost, I believe, in the last calendar year as a singles match. Mm-hmm. I was there. It was fantastic. I couldn't tell you which one was better, the one that I saw live or this one, because they're just so good. They gel mm-hmm. together and it only takes one move or one counter to uh, to make it all work out yeah. so uh that's that's the magic of those two they make magic together and they have a history of course when jay white they they ran the whole thing where jay lost to 
I believe it was Kota Ibushi at the uh, Wrestle Kingdom main event. Then they went to New Year's Dash, and he was beaten clean by Ishii with the Brain Buster, and that sent Jay into a kind of a spiral where he kind of went off into hiding for a while and then came back pissed off at, at Ishii. So these two have an intertwined history. So you add that in with their ability, yeah. and it just makes for really good stuff. What well, long form uh, storytelling too? He yeah. he had the nervous breakdown. He went away. Mm-hmm. He got all those shit together, and now he's come back and he's made Bullet Club more stronger than ever, and he's the world champion. That's how you bounce back from uh, uh, from an obstacle. Good for you, Jay White. Good for you. <laughs> there you go. So we move on to day two or day five, rather day two in OTA, and uh, this one was uh, better attended. Uh, like I said, nine. 19- 1919 was the attendance on the first night, 2518 on the second night. So the Sunday afternoon show doing well, uh, attendance wise. And you had El Phantasmo beating Yujiro Takahashi. Now, this match was probably more interesting for the uh, for the chicanery than it was for the actual wrestling. So I'll just recap this very, very quickly. So Yujiro Takahashi comes out with Peter, of course. Big match Peter is there, and he tries to sell peter to elp being the pimp that he is he is the tokyo pimp after all and he is trying to sell peter to elp uh phantasmo if phantasmo will lay down well they do this with bullet club all the time where one in it and i you know claims that they're going to lay down for the other and then there's a small package or there's a some sort of uh cheap shot or something like that they always try to out out schnooker each other there with that and they always talk about collusion and it never happens well, that's what happened here. Uh, they ended up having a match that's pretty decent for a Yujiro Takahashi match, and uh, including one of my favorite spots of the whole time. I don't know why no one thought of it. I've been watching wrestling since 1983, Jeremy. I don't think I've ever seen anyone rack somebody else while kicking out of a pin attempt like that. And it was okay. a thing where, so he's, so <laughs> yeah. you, you had ELP like doing the cover and he's just kind of just kind of hovering over him you know like not not like a full laying on him cover but one where you're uh you know just on your knees and you got your hands on the guy's Mm -hmm. chest kind of a lazy pin what old talk did lazy pin yujiro is in bad shape but he manages to kick up his arm his right arm happens to be between phantasmo's legs as phantasmo's covering him so when he shoots his arm up it goes right into the am bags I can't believe that I've been watching wrestling that long and I don't think I've ever seen that. And it worked and it made sense. And it, I just like, huh? Yeah. I'll yeah. be darned. Like every once in a while, I see something that's right in front of your face the whole time. And no one ever did it that I could remember. And this, there's probably people screaming at, this, at, at their I YouTube right now gotta... saying, no, they did it then. And I was like, you're right. You're probably right. <laughs> I don't got to have been one, but, yeah. but not on a level of the G1 tournament yeah. stature where people are immediately going to, you know, <laughs> Good job by you if you're able to go to the YouTube comments and let us know what's go- yeah. which one it is. We're going to give you a shout out next time. How about Prove that Stephen one? wrong, exactly. I'm sure it's happened. Right? Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen it before. Anyway, it ended up creating a little bit of doubt, but uh, it even turned uh, ELP, El Fantasma, was the baby face in this one. The crowd was on his side mm-hmm. because they even had the lights out interfering, which I hate. I hate the lights out thing. Like, why do heels have access to the electrical system, allegedly? Um, although in AEW, every new guy gets access to the electrical system. You get that with your key you get that with your pass and your you know they they say oh here's the key to the electrical system in case you want to shut out the lights in the middle of a national television show um but they did it again here with show um and uh peter ended up leaving with el phantasmo so there was a baby face pop for that um that that ended up uh we'll get to that but uh, anyway uh <laughs> for a user for a user takahashi match this wasn't half bad you know, uh, Yujiro Takahashi so far has, he has risen to the level of the performers that he's in the ring with. You yeah. don't expect much on his own, but in the but in the matches that he's had with Will Ospreay and El Fantasmo, he has held his end of the bargain and come off looking better, uh, come off looking a bit refreshed. A lot of these lower guys that have been dismissed like Yoshihashi and, and Yujiro, uh, they are, they're bringing it. They're bringing it, and they're they're making sure that their their spot on the roster is uh, is protected. You know, I'm gonna tell you when this match started, I did not think that it was going to be a treaty on sex work, uh, affirmative consent, <laughs> and uh, and whatever else that that was. But hey, you learn something new, and gender politics is, is something that you really need to respect. And I'm and mm-hmm. I and I'm and I'm here for Peter uh, realizing her own value. 
And in the backstage comments, uh, El Fantasma was uh, uh, selling the uh, selling the undercarriage shot as well, uh, which put him under real pressure with uh, with uh, Peter since she was with him. So that you know he was he was sweating at leaving the building as well as sweating it during his match. He was worried. Uh, after that, now we had a match. There were all kinds of Easter eggs in this next match. Sonata and Taichi. Now these are two guys that were not brought up in the New Japan system. They were brought up in the All Japan system, and they wrestled a match that was an absolute tribute to the King's Road style matches of the big four, the four pillars. And there were so many little things in there. And if you're a nut for that era of all Japan pro wrestling, like I am, uh, I used to do the tape trading in college about new Japan or all Japan and new Japan really. But my, my favorite was, were, uh, were those all Japan matches. This one had a little bit of that, uh, for for us, and there was uh, Sonata and Taichi went in there, and they're good friends in real life, mm-hmm. and they acknowledge that, which is unusual because they are in different factions. But they acknowledge that even in comments that these guys are buddies in real life, and they did the Akira Tawe Mitsuharu Masawa Nodoa spot where one guy jumps off into a choke slam, boom. They did Masawa and Kawada again where uh the Misawa's rolling elbow he spins around to deliver the hard forearm mm-hmm. and as he spins Kawada jump or not Kawada it was Taichi that jumped up and clobbered Sonata with the Enzugiri as he turns around uh there was a tiger suplex in this one you don't see a lot of tiger suplexes in New Japan no, 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 uh, no. <laughs> what's that no 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 you don't <laughs> no, no you don't and uh it, this was fabulous there was a really great ghetto clutch uh false finish there after an eye gouge you want to talk about the long-term storytelling mm-hmm. jay white got his win by gouging sonata's eyes and turning the skull end into the blade runner this is one where taichi went to the eyes and got an incredible near fall off the gato clutch and it just is one of those things where that they're so careful about these little details. And in the end, Sonata hit an O'Connor roll with that deep bridge that uh, he does better than just about anybody. It's and, so good. Yeah. And that, and that came after a sumo throw from Taichi, which is getting over that sumo throw. It's, it's a hip toss. He's getting a hip toss over Jeremy. Uh, this was terrific. I love this match. Uh, Taichi is quickly becoming a guy I really enjoy watching. I always enjoy Sonata. I loved it. Yeah, you know, it. it's unfortunate that this match happened on this night uh, under the two, two matches below it because I feel like it kind of got lost in the shuffle with some of the things that you saw later on with the, the sub and the main event. So this is a match that I may have to go back and rewatch because – as we were talking about it, it was the one I had the the least amount to say about yeah. because it was good. It was really good, and it and but I didn't know the things that you knew about it, so oh, okay. it didn't it didn't translate back in the way that it did. And I and I love Sonata. There were times where I thought he should have won the G one in the last couple of years. And Taichi is a is a guy that you know uh, I'm always going to say good things about, even though when I started watching New Japan, a lot of people had knocks on him. He doesn't. I don't. I don't see the same knocks that other people have. Well, they, so, they were legit. They were legit back then. I gotta yeah, say, like yeah. When he, when he was a junior heavyweight, it wasn't working. And no. uh, but but it, it night and day in the last couple of years. But when he's come into the the big match tournament and and mm. when he's had to go, like I I can't I can't go onto a computer screen and type out. Yeah, I was really disappointed. But what Taiichi brought in this match, it mm. I had I don't remember the last time I said that. And I I'll be like, actually, Taiichi is one of the the better veterans and. Brings, uh, brings B game, if not A game, every time that he's got to bring it. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm going to have to rewatch this one in all honesty. And I don't say that too often about matches, but uh, after, after your recommendation for it and what I really just don't remember from it, I need to go back to it. it. You know, it's one of those things where if you're an all Japan fan from that area, you just recognize certain key spots from major matches of that time. And, and of course, back then we used to watch those things until those tapes wore out. I, so I've watched some of those some Misawa Kawada matches dozens of times, you know, yeah, I, it just, you know, I just loved it. And it went, the internet was barely able to put a picture, you know, you'd, you'd click on a JPEG and then you would have to go like do laundry for a while, make mm-hmm. dinner. And then you come back and the photograph might be up. That was when I was in college. And so you weren't watching anything on, on the internet, you know, everything had to be done with VHS. So you didn't have the 
wealth of matches. You just had your tapes and you watched the hell out of your yeah. tapes. So that was a, it was a bit of a throwback for me in, in, uh, in that way. Anything that you have a long running like investment in and your yeah. and your viewership is rewarded in a way where you do the Leonardo DiCaprio meme where you're holding the cup and you're like, oh, yeah, that. And you're <laughs> yes, like, I know me, exactly yes. what you're talking about. You're like, that, that, is a meme. The best, that is the best feeling in the world. And I'm never going to undercut that when somebody actually <laughs> feels it because you're like, I know what that's from. <laughs> yes. They, you're right. They memed me. I didn't think about that, but you're right. They memed me during that match. There they're like, go. they got you. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of how different things are. And like, we're sitting there watching these matches almost live. I, I wake up in the morning and I watch them. I don't yeah. get up at like 4.30 to watch these. But uh, I do for Wrestle Kingdom. Like I stay up. Wrestle Kingdom is on my birthday every year. So like my birthday is like I stay up all. Wait, um, what is your birthday? Um, January 4th. Yeah. I January, January 4th. 6th. Oh, no kidding. Well, there yeah, you go. See, yeah, so yeah. New Japan gives me a, my first birthday present every year. It comes from New Japan. It's the Wrestle Capricorn Kingdom. Capricorn buddy. So, yeah. So I, I stay I stay up, have coffee and snacks and watch. But, uh, you know, back then, to give you an idea of just how different it was, I got the Kenta Kobashi winning the Triple Crown on VHS within two weeks of it happening. And that was considered pretty mind blowing at the time. Like you already have that match. Like the, 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 the other, uh, the, the handful of Japanese wrestling nerds at Indiana university were like, you already have it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Within two weeks, baby. Get the nerd. <laughs> Within two in weeks. <laughs> Airmail baby. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Moving on from that. No, no, was good. I mean, that you got me good on that. <laughs> So we had uh, Jeff Cobb and Bad Luck Fale. Uh, this was a one-move match. This was I, a one-move match. Yeah, he he managed to suplex Fale, which is always good for a pop because yeah. just Fale doesn't go up for everybody, and uh, but he knows when to, and he knows that this is the right time to, and then he gave the tour of the islands to that monster of a man. And I like Bad Luck Fale personally. Like if you see anything of him out of character. He comes off really well. And there's that Lion's Pride was a fantastic documentary series on New Japan World about his dojo in New Zealand. He comes off great there. Mm -hmm. There are a couple other things about him uh, where on New Japan World where he comes off terrific. He's not been great in the ring lately. And this was a tough match to watch at times, but it was all to build for that spot. And uh, they got there. And when it did happen, it wowed the crowd. Yeah, that the one move match, the tour of the islands on Fale. I replayed it like three times. I was like, "Oof, ooh, look at that core strength!" <laughs> uh, Amazing. It they're building Cobb to be Godzilla, king of the monsters. You have a monster bracket, and he's the king of all the monsters. And you know, it's going to come down to Okada and Cobb in the in the finals, I believe, uh, on that bracket. And they're setting up, they're setting it up so that. When it happens, only one is going to walk out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, one move match, keep Cobb strong, belt Cobb one day. I love the man. He's great. Fale, he's there to serve a purpose. So far, he has served that purpose. And uh, keep training them guys, guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe he'll come up with some good ones there. So uh, actually, well, it was it uh, Hikaleo. Looks like he's a pretty talented guy, and that was one that he has uh, he has had a big hand in training. So, uh, moving on to the main event of night two here, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Tetsuya Naito. This match is you know two all time New Japan legends, and the thing that I had my my note right here is these guys still have the minds, but they don't have the bodies anymore. Nope, and, and it's just injury after injury after injury for both of them. There was a count-out spot that they absolutely missed. Red Shoes had to cover for him. Naito was too slow in getting in. That should have been a double count-out. And I'm not saying they should have done it, but I mean, like, he, they tried to tease a double count-out, and then neither one of them could get their bodies moving fast enough to get back in by time. And Red Shoes had to make it 21, you know. <laughs> but it, no one wanted a double count-out right there. I'm not complaining about that. And, you know, not, they shouldn't have uh, done a double count-out, but... Red Shoes had to work pretty hard to delay that 20 count because they just don't have the mobility anymore. Yeah. And e- either one of them do. And, but they have the mind and they have the psychology. And this was still a really good match. But man, it just makes they have you the think presence back. too. Even the two yeah. of them in yeah. the ring together, yeah. you know, will forgive a lot. Like yeah. I looked, I looked past a lot in this match because it was those two and the story just felt big 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there are matches that are like you circle like, ooh, that's gonna be kind of a special match. And sometimes the work rate doesn't have to make it special, but if the two people in the ring and how they play off of each other, and I, I apologize for cutting you off in the middle of what you were no, saying. No, no, it's fine. Uh, but the post match where they kind of, where Tanahashi mm-hmm. kind of crawled over to Naito and Naito's just sitting there smarting and he's just like, I can't believe you got me on that one. And mm-hmm. they had that veteran kind of moment where they just sat there and you, they were just like, just kind of smiling with each other. But like in a way that like, it wasn't fully friendly, but still competitive. And it was just two, two warriors that just went to battle one more time. And, you know, they, they've done this so many times that they know each other in and out and like this time I got you and uh, we'll see how it goes next time. The stakes were high for this match, of course, because both were booked to lose their first one. Mm-hmm. So in, in a match where they're in a tournament where there are only six tournament matches, the idea of going 0-2 was uh, looming for a legend, either one of them. And so there were a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of tension in this one because, you know, who was going to go 0 and 2 turned out to be Naito. Uh, Tanahashi got him on an inside cradle. And, and but still, I, when I was watching this match, I thought back to, I guess it was a, uh, I'm trying to think it was, it wasn't a Wrestle Kingdom show, but it was a an intercontinental title match back when Naito was still like the the new new heel Naito. He hadn't. He hadn't turned babyface and, and won people's affection. That took years. You know, he was still kind of hated after, after coming back from Japan and or from uh, Mexico to Japan. And they had a match, and it was for the uh, Intercontinental title. It was a big one. It was in Osaka, so it may have been uh, it may have been in the summertime. But he that one was an incredible match between two great guys, and I just remember how quick they still were and things and watching this one, it's, it's a two very different men in there right now, but their minds still sharp as tax. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, like I said, I was, I was a bit more forgiving just knowing that Tanahashi and Naito both haven't been what they were supposed to be the knees on both of them. I think they have one Ooh. good knee between the four of them. And, uh, <laughs> hopefully if you had one good knee between, between two that you're able to make it work but it, you know if the, they, if, the they 60, know the if the 60 year old red shoes has the two best knees in the match that's where we're, that's that's where you're looking and uh but you know again still two terrific workers this this was not a bad match this is not me saying that was a bad match but i will always appreciate naito and tanahashi in a high level match trying to do what they do for the audience because there's nobody like either one of them. And when they're together, they make magic. Sometimes the magic doesn't, you know, isn't as good as the other magic, but it still would have been a magic. The next Tetsuya Naito match that happens in this tournament is going to tell us what story they're telling with him. That's going to tip us off because if he loses and goes 0-3, he's out. It's over with. And so then it becomes, it's a teardown story. Like they're going to strip him for parts. So he's going to, and Ghetto will do that with a guy. He's done it with Tanahashi a couple of times. He's done it with others where it just looks like it's over for them. And then the rally, the heroic rally comes. That could be the story they're telling with Naito or that rally could start in his next match. I think if he loses his next match, then it's going to be like this little spiral where he's just, uh, he's not what he used to be. He used to be the top guy. And then he makes the big push after the tournament. If he wins the next match, I think he goes on a four match run. <laughs> I think That's I, just I, my guess. That's my guess. I don't have inside information, but that's how I feel like Gato is taking this. My 100%, I 100% agree with you. I think he's going on a four match run to win and to tiebreaker into the finals with a win. Uh, listen, he's got evil. He's got Kenta. Yeah. He's got Zack Sabre Jr. And I know there's one more in there somewhere, but those are all, yeah, those are all matches he's going to win. You know, you know what I mean? Or like, if not, it's going to be a shocking upset because those are all guys. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I just, I, I don't, I don't know how to put it other than like the writing feels on the wall on a four and two tiebreaker into yeah. the, into the, final or the final four i think kenta is the other one i don't think he's yeah no i had kenta, kenta evil got yeah, Ken, no, kenta i couldn't evil remember who the last one was. and all right he's gonna win Kena, yeah with the Kena, achilles yeah. story uh yeah, yeah. like these, yeah. this feels like like well played i see where this is going if he goes zero and three and it's that saber jr listen any one of those guys maybe they want to rehabilitate kenta and put him 
put him in there, but you know, I feel like Osprey is the D block candidate to to beat. And if you're going to put Osprey in there, you want to put somebody special in there to face him to to get to the finals. And so, read read the tea leaves, I suppose. <laughs> so we move on from that to Corican Hall back in uh, back in uh, Tokyo Dome City, Corican Hall, uh, and that was on the 26th. Uh, One thousand three hundred twelve basically filled up the joint uh, for the uh, two nights of G1 there, and the first one. Uh, it had the first uh, match was Chase Owens and the Great Okan, and this one went uh, just under 12 minutes. Uh, they had Chase Owens throw powder in uh, Khan's eyes to get the early advantage. It was a pretty good match. Uh, the uh, there were some clever moves from Chase Owens, like grabbing Great Okan's arms, falling back out of the ring, and which basically popped the uh, the neck of Great Okan on the top rope, which weakened him for the finisher. Chase upsets people at Korokan Hall is the story here. And he did it last year with Hiroshi Tanahashi. And while this isn't the upset on the level of the Tanahashi win, I think most people probably had Great Okan winning this match going into it. But Chase gets the win, and uh, it's going to factor into the main story right here. But uh, it seems to be they're doing a thing where each year, watch out for Chase in Tokyo. Chase will get you. Um, I, think the, I think the takeaway... And the compliment that I have to give to New Japan is that a year ago, a year ago, if you were to express any, if you were to ask the audience of their interest level in the Great Ocon and Chase Owens as draws or interest in New Japan, neither one of them were going to be uh, atop anybody's list or even like honorable mention. And I think the work that they've both done this year, Chase Owens with Folly and the Tag, and Great Ocon basically just entertaining people both in and outside of the ring, uh, you had you had a narrative that was like Chase Owens upset Great Ocon. Like repeat that out loud and think about a year ago if you yeah. were going to have a conversation that said Chase Owens upset Great Ocon. <laughs> So good job by New Japan, number one, to elevate mm-hmm. Great Ocon to a point where he could be upset. And number two, putting Chase Owens in a position where he has credibility to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't watch that match and think Chase Owens won that match. I was like, oh, okay. You know, it was it was more like a mild surprise rather than the upset of like the Hanari Tanahashi. And yeah. so uh, both of them have a bright future in the mid card into the upper mid card of New Japan. I don't see world championness in either one of them. No, but uh, they both have a long career work in the style, and I, I'm happy to watch them whenever they're in the ring. So the next one was Evil and Kenta, and Evil beat Kenta by countout, and this was the shenanigans match, and this wasn't good. I didn't think this was good at all. Uh, the what little action there was aired on the silly side uh kenta going underneath the ring to grab a weapon and he comes out with his book uh in paperback didn't even bother to get a hardback so it would look like it would hurt uh it, it was just a tough one and we did the the lights out crap again this time dick togo vanished from ringside and when kenta tried to get into the ring dick togo is grabbing his leg the referee has to pretend like he doesn't know or care what's going on and counts kenta out uh didn't enjoy this one. I don't know what else to say about it. I, I don't like the. I don't think they do this stuff well. It's not New Japan's wheelhouse. Uh, I, I just. I don't enjoy any of it. That's fair. Uh, the only. The only thing that I took away from this match. <coughs> excuse me. The only thing that I took away from this is that there. If you were looking, there were possible seeds of breaking off House of Torture from Bullet Club regular. And they've been teasing it for a while. I hope to see it happen. I don't think the two factions fit with each other very well, but who knows? So other than that, not much to say about this match. We'll move on then. Next one was also one that I don't think lived up to a whole lot of expectations. I didn't have great expectations mm-hmm. for this match, to be fair. But and I guess I got what I came thought I was going to get. And this was Lance Archer defeating Tom Lawler, Filthy Tom. And uh, Tom's preview tag's been pretty good. He and Royce Isaac's doing a really good job. Yes. I think in these preview tags. And uh, I think both of them have looked good. Uh, This, I don't think, was a great matchup for Tom. And what I mean by that is just entertainment-wise, Archer's 
not great at working the sub in and out of submissions. It's just not what he does. Well, he does a big man match well, and he does those high impact matches uh, well. But as far as like getting in and out of leg locks and arm locks and things, that's not Archer's strength. And I think, unfortunately, this match didn't quite play to his strength. And in the end, uh, you know, he it was just basically that uh, Lawler was overpowered by Archer and, and, and Archer just overcame him and overwhelmed him physically and beat him. Mm -hmm. And that was a story to be told. Again, I mentioned that looking at the way New Japan Strong has been thought of for the most part in when on a main card, like what we saw at forbidden door and things you kind of get a feeling that tom waller's not going to be winning too many matches the singles matches here um but this one it, it to me it just it didn't quite do it for me i guess it did what it had to do but as far as the action in the ring goes i'm, I'm not sure it played to everyone's strengths yeah you know i think we, we peek behind the curtain i i texted you about this match specifically because there were things that i really liked about this match yeah. uh the things that i liked was that it was Tom Lawler just jumping around, showing off what he could do in terms of submissions. And he had some really creative approaches mm -hmm. to try and get a submission onto Archer. And that, to me, was enough to get past what the faults of the match were, were the creative ways that uh, Lawler was trying to defeat him. And to me, that was enough because I'm just, I'm such a, a, a Lawler dork that <laughs> I, I'm willing to look past the fact that, like, he was in there with Lance Archer. You know what Lance Archer is about. If you've watched AEW, you know what Lance Archer is about. He's exactly the same wrestler that you saw in New Japan three years ago. You know what you're getting with Lance Archer. There's not, to me, there's not disappointment when it comes to Lance Archer because my, my baseline is so low. Oh. So I was just happy was seeing Lawler in there working hard to get a to get like good visuals and to set up this idea that when he's on a guy that's more his size and he pulls these moves, they're going to be devastating. And it's just one of those like wasn't his match, wasn't his day, but you know, maybe next time he faces off against Clint Karcher, he's gonna have a different outlook. Well we went into the main event after that and boy was this Terrific. I love this. This is my favorite match of the week. Uh, and there were some very good ones. David Finlay defeated Juice Robinson in a 24 minute, one second that felt a lot quicker than that. This did not feel like a, a long match. Uh, and uh, I guess 24 minutes is considered a long match now, but it didn't feel that way. It was brisk. I, a lot of selling by Finlay. And this was, of course, the big grudge match. These two were the Finn Juice tag team. And they never really had the turn moment in the ring. Juice kind of did the thing where he worked everybody that he was quitting and then showed up with Bullet Club. And they played it like he was working Finlay as well and that, that he wasn't telling Finlay what was going on. And that's the story. Uh, more than Juice just turning on him during mm -hmm. a match like a lot of tag teams break up. But it got appropriately nasty. I mean, there was heat between these two. They were ang They came off angry at one another. They came off like they were trying to hurt one another. There were a lot of good comebacks and near falls, a terrific performance. Uh, the Finlay stuff especially, he looked like this is a guy that has hurt my feelings, turned my back on me, then hurt me physically, and I am going to do something about it in the best possible way. And there were some wonderful sequences in this. Uh, and I just thought these were two guys that really understood that this was a big match for both of them and both stepped up. The selling was good. The anger was good. The way things went down in the end made sense. Uh, and it even came out realistic to me that like that this is how these two people would handle this situation. Uh, I got nothing good things to say about this one. I love the match. Finlay gets a big win. And uh, I love the whole thing. The, the juice having his, uh, left hand softened up by Finlay. He worked the left hand because Juice is a southpaw, so he couldn't do the punch. He ended up doing a right hand punch off of a plancha to the outside on Finlay that looked great. Threw him, it gave him a pile driver on the floor, which they had teased earlier, so it built to something. And when they hit it, there was a shriek from the Corican Hall crowd. He gets the left hand punch. In finally, his is his big punch in on him. He tries the rock slide. Finlay gets out. Uh, belts, shillelaghs uh, abound after that, and uh, 
And then not only that, Finlay, the ultimate baby face, doesn't want to pin him off an illegal blow and ends up giving him his finisher and getting the win. Nothing but good things to say about it, Jerry. I'm sorry I went on about it so long. No, I love this no, thing. No. I thought it was great. I, you say all the things that I need to say. I'm just going to say <laughs> I agree fully. Uh, <laughs> there are things about this match that changed my uh, changed how I look at both guys. So oh, wow. let me put it to you this way. Finley had the match with Hangman Page in AEW uh, a month or two ago, right? Mm-hmm. I think that if he had that match today after this match with Juke, I would have looked at him differently with more credibility as someone in that match okay. as opposed to before. This mm-hmm. is a, that's the kind of like elevation match, like your stature within the company, your, your respect or what you can accomplish next feels more uh, surmountable now. Uh, as a result of the match that you had here. So I think that we may be heading into uh, four people now in the North American title. We got Osprey, Sonata, um, yes. Juice, and now Finley all kind of in the mix for that title, which is going to be an interesting story coming out of G1. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, too, because that was something that I left off. Finlay, of course, had that. We we talked about he tried. Jew still has the U.S. belt, the physical belt, although Osprey is the champion. So he was going to use the belt on on Finlay. Finlay ended up blocking it with a shillelagh and then uh, disarming uh, Juice and clobbering him with the shillelagh. So he he, uh, countered the belt shot. Afterwards, though, Finlay said if Will Osprey wants his belt back, he's got to go through him. So that was a, a bit of a surprise. But, yeah, this is a match where Finlay afterwards, you're thinking, oh, he can do this, too. Yeah. You know, and, and it was a thing that may open the eyes to, like, this guy's got uh, maybe a, a higher ceiling than uh, before the match. So that it's it's the ultimate win for everybody there. He had his opportunity, and he hit it out of the park. So that was the 26th, and we moved on to the 27th now, and we're going into uh, Will Ospreay's biggest challenge, and that was Yujiro Takahashi, uh, his match against Yuj. Uh, you know, and I, my first note on this one is if Yujiro goes 2-0, and we riot, and that was what I write there. Uh, <laughs> now, the most entertaining part of this one, uh, to me, was that Peter kind of hesitantly kind of snuck down the aisle after Yujiro's entrance and put up the little uh, two sweet sign in apology to Yujiro for leaving with ELP and uh, to show that uh, love conquers all, or at least the uh, pimp ho relationship conquers all. <laughs> Yujiro embraced her, and there was a uh, an actual feeling of relief in the crowd. I think the crowd was Everybody happy was super that. happy. <laughs> they were like, oh, yay, they're back together. Our, our, oh, our, she's back with her oppressor. Our sex, nice? our sex work act is oh, back together. That's. Thank- Great. <laughs> Thank God our, our our trafficker is back with his business. Uh, Thank God. There wasn't a whole lot to Strange. say about this match. So that we had that we had this like one G1 story kind of flip yeah. over. You know, <laughs> it really just covered for the fact that there wasn't so a lot going on with this match. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Will's very good at near falls. And and but even he, like no one thought Yujiro Takahashi was winning. This thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but, but hey, it was a uh, for a usual match. It was, again, it was good. Like like you mentioned, he's he's at least pushing himself a little bit. Although, I, I don't know of a guy that moves slower in the ring than he does. It he just is so slow. Everything he does is just really slow. I and it's his style. It's a conscious choice from him, and it's interesting. It's just, um, I boy, it, it's sure. tough. But when I watched Osprey come out from this match, I think he was just wearing a t-shirt and the Rev Pro belt, and he looked mm-hmm. like he had just woken up from being hungover from the night before. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, it was like it was Jonathan Gresham adjacent where he came out in like his t-shirt and the belt before the Ring of Honor match, mm-hmm. as opposed to like the full gear and the regalia. And it was like, I don't know, dude, it's Yujiro Takahashi, but come on, have a little respect for the guy. <laughs> oh boy yeah so then we get into another one that was thankfully short it was bad luck Fale beating toro yano uh at least this was quick i guess the story they were trying to tell was that Fale out yano yano he uh managed to send yano into the exposed turnbuckle that uh, of course yano take the turnbuckle pad off and then rolled him up uh rolled him up uh just like that just wasn't any big high impact move didn't give him the bad luck fall 
and uh, he just rolled up uh, Yano. At least it was it was five minutes and thirty six seconds. And just the fact that they did not make me watch a ten minute Yano Fale match, I'm going to give it props. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. It was quick. Perfectly academic. Moving on. <laughs> On to uh, a pretty darn good one now. Uh, Hiroki Goto defeated Aaron Hanare. Exactly what you think from these two. Mm-hmm. Hard hitting, stiff, really good. And it uh, built nicely. There was enough doubt created because Goto and Hanare had won big matches in their first go around. So who was going to go 2-0 here? Uh, is this a big push for Hanare? Well, they ended up going with the veteran Hiroki Goto and getting the win. But uh, very good. This is exactly what a semi-main event should be. Just sure. a really good wrestling match between two really good guys and uh, a, a solid win for Goto, which gets him uh, back on the uh, four points in the tournament. Yeah, I like this story that Goto's uh, winning for his kids kind of thing. Uh, yes. That's a, that's a cute story, you know, like yeah. it gives him something. To, gives him something. No one thinks Goto's going to win the whole thing. No one thinks he's going to win his bracket. But it gives you something to be like, yeah, look, you, look, look for the guy he's doing it for the kids come on and if you if you haven't heard this if you don't have new japan world the storyline on this one is that uh and I mean, it's probably true but goto has a young son and there is a holiday in japan that happened just before the g1 started where apparently the whole idea is kids write down their wishes and most kids say that uh, well i want to be an astronaut i want to be a firefighter policeman type of thing goto's kids said i want my dad to be what was it the, the win the g1 be the world heavyweight champion and the tag team champion so no pressure pops no pressure and uh so uh goto's doing it for his uh, rather demanding young child but uh you know hey, he, he, he thinks a lot he, he thinks a lot of his dad right? and so do i by god i think he's terrific the thing you do for love i i get it <laughs> i get it you try and the main event, another ter- another really good match. Uh, this is Tomohiro Ishii. He defeated Tama Tonga. And uh, 20 minutes, and it felt like a really good competitive contest. This babyface run for Tama Tonga is exactly what his career needed. It's working. And he he does come off as somebody that you, after being after years of being, you know, a jerk and the guy that was always interfering, uh, in, either interfering or having interference and things like this whole bucket of cold water dumped on him from Jay White, just kicking him to the curb after he helped found Bullet Club. And you do have sympathy for the guy. And then the way he's working as a baby face uh, comes off really well. Tomohiro Ishii, of course, I mentioned it earlier. He's he's one of my personal favorite wrestlers to watch. I think he just works well with everybody. And he's that Terminator guy, like I said, that just keeps coming. And uh, he beat Tama Tonga in this one, but Tonga put up a heck of a fight. And this was a good match. I thought it was a decent uh, Corican main event. Yeah. It's really hard to say that a match over delivered when you have Tomohiro Ishii and honestly, Tamatonga lately, uh, but they over delivered and completely surpassed what I thought they were going to do in this kind of match. Mm-hmm. Uh, give Ishii. He could do this match. He could do his matches with the eyes closed. I wasn't sure that Tamatonga could bring it to that level and put himself in in a tier in which, like, I the credibility, kind of like the Finley thing, um, where you have a lot of these guys that have existed at a certain level in mm-hmm. New Japan, and now that they're breaking, uh, breaking the concrete around their feet in a, in a lot of ways, and they're they're out of where they were. Tamatonga is is t- making the best of every opportunity, and you know I look at I look at his body armor kind of gear, and I think, eh, you know, whatever. But uh, I can't I can't tell you that it's not working. You you know what I mean? Like yeah. what whatever they've decided to do and like rehabilitate and turn him face and give him kind of a, a Rocky Maivia almost vibe, <laughs> but. Uh, but it's it's more like it's modernized is the word I'm looking for, mm-hmm. and not WWE eyes. Like you can do a blue like a blue chip baby face kind of like this this guy. He's not blue chip, but you know what I'm saying. Like mm-hmm. like just white meat baby face in a lot of ways, smiling, coming out there, gonna gonna get the crowd behind you. There there's a lot of 
baby face in him. And if you see it done by a competent company, you're like, oh, yeah, that actually can work. Huh. How about that? <laughs> go figure. So we're going to do a quick standings update here. So I'm going to go through this now. A, uh, a Block is led by Kazuchika Okada and Bad Luck Fale with uh, four points each. And uh, at the bottom, Jonah and Tom Lawler with zero points, and uh, but with more matches to come. That's that's one thing that I think they've each uh, only had one. With and Jeff then, Cobb to keep an eye out for. Yeah, Jeff Cobb keep an eye out for. Actually, Yano and Lance Archer occupying the two points uh, slots there. In block B, Jay White is all alone on top with four. Taichi, Tamatanga, Sonata, Chase Owens, and Tomo Ishii each have two. Uh, most of those guys are uh, one and one or one and two. Great Okan uh, yet to get on the board early on. Uh, we're about one third of the way through this tournament totally. You can Blocks. get 12 points maximum in any block. Block or 10, C. right? Uh, it's going to be, well, you know, 12. That, that's, you have, uh, right? Yeah. No, yeah, there's ten. seven guys seven guys in each one. So six okay. matches, you can score 12 points. Got it. Math is hard. Uh, yeah. Zach's <laughs> Zack Sabre Jr. and Hiroki Goto are right now leading the C block. This is the most wide open block because Hanare, Hiroshi Tanahashi, and Evil are at uh, two points each. Tetsuya Naito and Kento, uh, Kenta are uh, not yet on the board. And we had uh, Will Ospreay alone atop the D block. Juice Robinson, Yujiro, Shingo Takagi, El Fantasmo, David Finlay with two points. Yoshihashi with the goose egg as it stands right now. And Jeremy, I know that uh, we have uh, a lot of interest in the E block. These are all the people that are in the preview tags, yes. but are not in the tournament. And right Update now, me. <laughs> here we go. Uh, well, it's Bushi in the lead. He has eight points. He has been on the winning side of four preview tags. And then Bad Dude Tito and Show are tied with six in second place right now. So Bad Dude Tito and Jonah have been winning most of their preview tags. And uh, House of Torture... Uh, with with show anyway doing all right uh, with six points right there but uh, yeah Bushi so far uh, in the lead for that trophy. Can I can I tell you real quick? Somebody compared Bad Dude Tito to Mark Marrow, and now I can't unsee it. Ooh, I mean, just look wise, like oh, looks he's, he's way better in the ring. But like, <laughs> if you look at Bad Dude Tito and then you look at a picture of Mark Marrow, you're like, oh, really? Oh, hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> I can't say I was aware of that. I'll have, maybe I'll have to go to, I may able to do a Google image search here and take a look. <laughs> so, Jeremy, do you have any, what can you tell us about Strong? Well, we have the upcoming episode of Hiroshi Tanahashi this weekend. And they have the tournament finals coming up of Yuya Uemura and Christopher Daniels versus Aussie Open for the finals of the New, J New Japan Strong Tournament uh, coming up soon. And there's not much else going on. It's really just New Japan G1 right now. Fair enough. Now, they just had a uh, taping, a show in uh, mm -hmm. Charlotte, I believe, uh, that should be uh, some pretty interesting stuff on that one. Uh, uh, yeah, Hiromu Takahashi is out uh, in, that, in that. And so you'll mm -hmm. be seeing him on New Japan Strong in the coming weeks. Uh, a few others, some really good stuff. I believe uh, Shota showed up there. Shota well. Mino's so, going to be there. Yeah. Uh, still, still a little iffy whether we want to reveal what's coming up upcoming, other than just like, hey, you know, Tanahashi's going to be on strong. So if you have your New Japan World, maybe you want to <laughs> check that out if you're not gotten enough uh, New Japan with the G1 going on. All right, yeah, yeah. Stephen, we're going to do your history lesson before we take this home. Okay, so we're going to go into, we talked about how the the World League Tournament was New Japan's original uh, tournament, and it started pretty much uh, just as New Japan was formed. They had one only a few uh, weeks uh, after uh, the uh, formation of the company. Well, they also fumbled around with a lot of different formats in that time. We talked about how there was a, a round robin and, and a foreign and an, inter or an international and a Japanese uh, bracket, and then uh, a round robin after that, after they have the field and think, well, this all kind of got convoluted. And so once they got uh, a few years into this, they got down to a, a more traditional format in Japanese round robin tournaments where it's just all these guys in the tournament. Sometimes it was eight, sometimes 10, sometimes 12. That depended on the year. But the basic thing was there was a round robin tournament. The top two point getters ended up in the final match. So first place and second place point accumulators would then go into the finals. And that's what they did for a few years. Now, they started really working hard with the WWF in the late 70s. 
to the point that they were starting to do things like the Madison Square Garden tour in Japan. And there was no, there were no matches in Madison Square. They just called it the Madison Square Garden tournament. WWF champion Bob Backlund would come over and and do tours. And they started getting more working agreements, people going back and forth between New Japan and the WWF. There were guys, uh, uh, Yatsu, for instance, uh, came over and uh, uh, wrestled in the WWF for a while. Uh, it was part of his excursion, I guess. And so you started seeing more of these working agreements. So they actually renamed the tournament the Madison Square Garden League. It was the MSG League, and that started in 1978. And there were indeed some uh, WWF wrestlers in it. So uh, this was, again, just the round robin, and uh, the top two men uh, move on to the final. So here was Andre the Giant was the number one guy. And again, we talked about how Killer Carl Krupp was the top foreigner back then uh, in the early days. Now we're starting to see some bigger names. Andre the Giant, of course, one of the biggest names in wrestling history. You also have uh, Bugsy McGraw, Nikolai Volkov, and Chief J. Strongbow. And J Chief J. Strongbow in the 70s was basically the gatekeeper for Bruno Sammartino and Bob Backlund at that point. I mean, if you beat J. Strongbow, you generally went up and got a title shot. This was not a small deal. The J. Uh, J. Strongbow was a big deal at that point. So in 1978, Andre the Giant and Antonio Inoki went to the finals. Andre won the finals by countout. So Andre won the first one that was designated the MSG League. We got even bigger names in the 1979 tournament. That was Antonio Inoki and Stan Hansen moving on to the finals. So Stan Hansen, who of course would become one of the biggest foreign stars in the history of Japanese wrestling, uh, just starting off, uh, and it was not his first tour by any means. He'd been going over for IWA and things, but this was a uh, big push in New Japan going to the finals. Andre the Giant also in that tournament. El Kanek, the Mexican legend. Larry Zabisco. This is in 1979, so before his run with Bruno. And then uh, Tony Gurria, uh, who has held the WWF tag team title multiple times. Uh, Inoki uh, defeated Stan Hansen in that one. And then the next year, those same two men went back to the finals in 1980. Uh, that time, in Inoki won by disqualification. Interesting note, Dusty Rhodes in the 1980 tournament and finished fourth, hey. just behind Andre. So Antonio Inoki, Stan Hansen, Andre the Giant, Dusty Rhodes, the top four finishers in that tournament. And uh, Chavo Guerrero. Go figure. Yeah. And then 1981... Uh, I'm moving through these a little bit quickly because I know we're a little bit short on time, but Stan Hansen and Antonio Noki again. So you see that Stan clicked with Japanese audiences very early, and it wasn't just in all Japan. He was a major star when he moved from New Japan to all Japan and what ended up being a seismic moment in wrestling history. That was in late 1981. In uh, 1981, he went to the finals in the spring of 1981. He went to the finals against Inoki. And this time defeated Inoki by countout. So you're talking about the guy that won the biggest tournament in New Japan that jumped over to All Japan later that year in a shock move. And it was a big a, a big surprise. We might get into that in the history here sometime as to what that meant to both companies. But uh, we're a little short on time now. Tiger Jeet Singh and the first appearance in a New Japan tournament by Hulk Hogan in 1981. Hogan at that point was just becoming uh, one of the biggest stars in the AWA. And uh, turning babyface after his heel run in the WWF and elsewhere, uh, feuding with Andre the Giant. So uh, also toward the bottom of that tournament, we had Bobby Duncombe, Sergeant Slaughter, and Chris Adams. So uh, those were and, and Mike Masters, a California star. Uh, and so you, you see some names here that you, you're getting to see that bigger and bigger names are going over for that tournament. Sergeant Slaughter, of course, is a big deal. Uh, 1981, that was the year he had the big alley fight match with Pat Patterson. So, uh, and uh, would go on to uh, headline for uh, Crockett and the, U and the U.S. title, leading to the to the final conflict. And I mean, so we're talking about some major, major stars here: Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Sergeant Slaughter, uh, Dusty Rhodes in these tournaments. So now the MSG League has gone from this tournament from an upstart company into a very important tournament with big names, big crowds. I mean, they're selling out Sumo Hall for a lot of these shows, and it's becoming one of the most important things in the Japanese wrestling calendar. Now, that went all the way until 1982, when once again Andre the Giant uh, went to the finals against Killer Khan 
Antonio Inoki was injured. Uh, that's a, it was a work uh, that uh, and could not move on to the final. So the third place finisher, Killer Khan, went in. The real reason, of course, Andre the Giant and Killer Khan was the biggest feud in the business because they said the Killer Khan broke Andre's ankle. And <laughs> Andre and Khan toured the world. It was a WWF angle. And nevertheless, they headlined Toronto. I think they even brought it to Atlanta. They brought it to Alabama. All these non-WWF territories just on the idea of Killer Khan was over just on the idea that he was the guy that injured Andre the Giant. I'll tell you a little secret, Jeremy. Andre actually injured himself away from the ring. They just wanted it as an excuse. They said, oh, Killer Khan broke his ankle in this match in Rochester. They just made that up out of whole cloth. Two best thing that <laughs> best thing that ever happened to Killer Khan in his life. The man made money forever off of that. I can only imagine when you're like telling me like, "Oh, you mean we're just going to tell this guy that this guy beat up Andre the Giant?" Yeah, sure. Was, License yeah. to print money. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it was too. I mean, they they headlined Montreal with this thing. They would go to non WWF places, and all they had to do was just say, "This is the guy. Here's the guy that broke Andre's ankle, and Andre's going to fight him," and uh, sold out all over the place. Really, one of the underrated as one of the bigger feuds as far as money goes because they could go anywhere with it and uh anyway 1982 this is the last msg league listen to the names in this tournament now i mentioned andre the giant going to the finals and beating killer khan in the finals so they did the big feud match there antonio Inoki finished second in the standings however they did the the thing where killer khan injured him so you see he say he injured andre he injured uh, Inoki. Uh, and again, uh, so now Killer Khan is uh, is over as hell in two different continents. Dick Murdoch, the mass superstar, uh, Tony Atlas, uh, Don Morocco, Magnificent Morocco, and Iron Sheik, all in that tournament, along with the usual Japanese stars of Segaguchi, uh, uh, Russia Kimura in this one, uh, Yatsu, and 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 others that were in the tournament almost every uh, every year. So. That gets us up through 1982. So now we have established this tournament as a major point in the calendar. The next year, they're going to take it a step further, Jeremy. They're going to have, the, they're not going to do the MSG League. It's going to be the International Wrestling Grand Prix. The term IWGP is going to be uh, invented and will come to the forefront in 1983. We'll get into all that next week. I see what you did there. So now, now we come to the preview edition of our show where we're going to just let you know what we're going to cover for next week yes. to get you excited with that as long, in addition to the IWGP uh, origin story that Stephen Conway is going to present to us. So get excited for that. On July 30th, we have in the A Block, Jonah versus Tom Lawler. B Block, Sonata versus Great O'Conn. C block will be Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Zack Saber Jr. Circle that one, and D block will be David Finley and Shingo, Kata Shingo Takagi. That's going to be a fantastic night. Really that good. is going to be this weekend. The following evening will be B block Jay White versus Chase Owens. We have five matches actually now: uh, Jay White versus Chase Owens, C block, Tetsuya Naito versus Evil. I'm predicting a Naito win on that one. <laughs> a block, we got Bad Luck Fale versus Kazuchika Okada. We have Jeff Cobb versus Lance Archer. I want to see a tour of the island called Lance Archer. Please and thank you. I think you're and, good. <laughs> D block, Juice Robinson versus Yoshihashi. And then we move on to August 2nd. We have Tomohiro Ishii versus Great Okan. D block, David Finley versus Will Ospreay. A block, Toro Yano versus Tom Lawler. There should That'll be, be comedy in that. That'll, That'll be, be that. interesting. We, we both had something to say about that one as soon as we heard that one. <laughs> yes, we did. That'll be interesting. B block, Tamatonga versus Sonata. And King of the Mid card, C block, Hiroki Goto versus Kenta. That will be a pick em in my mind. And fin Finlay versus Osprey, I'm really looking forward to after seeing the juice match there. We'll see what they come up with. So should be should be some very interesting stuff. And like you mentioned, five tournament matches now uh, yes. going forward. They're going to start to speed up a little bit. And uh, these two are those two first two that he mentioned are going to be in Nagoya. And then the mid uh, week uh, match will be uh, matches will be in uh, Hamamatsu in uh, Shizuoka. So uh, going back on tour and leaving Metropolitan Tokyo. So that's what we're going to be covering next week. Should be very interesting to watch. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm really looking forward to some of these matches. It's, it's really great with the six-match lineup. There isn't a whole lot of fat 
on yeah. the on the storytelling. Every match has a purpose. Everybody has a journey, and there's no lag time. Skip a match to really uh, keep the keep them on pace to tell the stories they want to tell. So we're we're firmly in the middle of the G1. We got four more weeks to go, and uh, you're gonna be seeing us every week until then. Yes, and hopefully you'll see the books back behind me again. I'm I'm, I'm in my sparsely popular my, my sparsely appointed room here, and I, I'm hoping to be able to move back in. We've been uh, getting some work done around the house, so hopefully it'll be a much more interesting background. Because uh, goodness knows you'd rather look at something other than me. I can guarantee it. So before we move on to next week here, uh, Jeremy, tell them about your socials, where they can find you, all those goodies. You can find me at Jer Finestone on Twitter. I'm not wholly active, but if you need to reach me or have feedback for the show or want to follow and have any interest in what i have to say about pro wrestling in general you can find me there steven how about you steven conway 88 on twitter and of course i'm writing for fight game media and uh, of course make sure you check out our show here and the other shows on the fight game media youtube feed so with that in mind we will be back in a week to talk about more of these shows the g1 matches and any other news that pops up for jeremy feinstone i'm steven conway thank you for watching strong style and speaking of strong style we'll catch you next week Bye.